Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today's webinar is brought to you by the State Federal RPS Collaborative. The title is Implications of EPA's CO2 Regulations for State Renewable Energy Programs and RPSs. Today's webinar is being hosted by Warren Leon. He's the Executive Director of CESA. Before we get started, I want to go over a quick housekeeping slide and give folks just another minute to, to log in. Today, all the participants on the webinar will be in listen-only mode. We will not be able to hear you throughout the broadcast. You can listen to this webinar either through your computer's mic and speakers or a headset, through VoIP, or through the telephone. So if you are on the phone, if you have computer speakers, feel free to use those. On the audio mode here, just choose the mode that you're connecting in, either the telephone or micro speakers, and we will not be able to hear you. We're going to ask that you please submit questions today via the question box that you see here. Type them in and hit send, and they'll be queued up by Warren Leon, and we will ask your questions during a Q&A at the end of all the presentations for as long as time allows. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted up on the CESA website at the URL that you see below, and all of our past uh, archived recordings of RPS webinars are also uh, to be found there, sorted by date. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn this over to Warren Leon. Again, Warren is the Executive Director of the Clean Energy States Alliance. So Warren, would you please go ahead? Great. Before we jump into today's topic, let me tell you a little bit about the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a national nonprofit organization that works to implement clean energy policies, programs, technology innovation, and financing tools. We primarily work at the state level. And at the core of our organization, CESA is a national network of public agencies that are individually and collectively working to advance clean energy. Now, on the next why one of the things we do is we manage the state federal RPS collaborative for the US Department of Energy and the Energy Foundation. The funding for um, this particular initiative comes from those two sources. And what the collaborative is, it's an information sharing um, initiative that involves state RPS administrators, federal agency representatives, and other stakeholders. We do a variety of things to advance dialogue and learning about RPS programs. Uh, we identify best practices. We have a number of um, activities that you can get involved with. We have a free monthly newsletter. We have um, other webinars and other events. In September, on September 22nd and 23rd, we'll have a national summit in Washington, D.C. Um, you can get on our mailing list by just going to the uh, link on your page, or if you don't remember that, go to CESA.org and just look for the RPS Collaborative and you could join our list. If we can go to the next slide, you know, I've been looking forward to today's webinar because I'm sure we've all heard about EPA's uh, draft rules for controlling emissions from um, carbon dioxide. And this is going to have a very significant impact in helping the country to address climate change. But it also has implications for renewable energy and for folks like yourselves on the call who care about state renewable energy programs, who care about state renewable portfolio standards. And what we're going to try to do on this call is give you information you need to understand how this um, rule relates to the programs and activities you're involved in. We're going to start with a presentation by Dave Farnsworth, who's senior associate at the Regulatory Assistance Project, um, affectionately called RAP. And then we're going to have responses from Matt Klaus, um, Director for Renewable Energy Policy and Programs in the Climate Protection Partnership Division at APA, and from Chris Sherry, who's Policy Analyst 
in the Climate Change Division in the Office of Atmospheric Programs at EPA. I'll introduce uh, Matt and Chris more fully when it's their time to speak. Um, I would like to suggest to you our speakers are going to be relatively brief today because we want to give a lot of time for your um, questions and any comments you want to make. So as you're going along, type your questions into the question box. So before um, Dave speaks and while Maria is getting his slides up there, let me tell you a little bit more about him. Um, he joined RAP in 2008, and prior to that, he was a hearing officer and staff attorney with the Vermont Public Service Board, and he was there for 13 years. And in that time, he was involved in a range of different national and regional organizations, um, including serving as a co-chair of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, staff subcommittee to the Committee on Energy Resources and the Environment. He saved, served in other similar roles within NARUC. He was a member of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative Staff Working Group. And so he's been thinking about a lot of these issues involved with both renewable energy, climate change, CO2 emissions for quite some time. And he's going to give us an overview of the EPA's rule and its implication for renewables. So it's all yours, Dave. Thank you, Warren. I hope you can hear me. You sound great. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as most of you know, uh, the United States is playing um, uh, is playing football against Germany today, and um, I, I imagine that if you're on this webinar, you are really, really big renewables fans. Uh, if you're missing that game, um, I won the coin toss so to speak, and I'll be kicking off here today. And as Warren said, um, Matt and Chris will be following up. What I'd like to do um, over the next 15 or so minutes is um, provide you all with a, um, <laughs> with a sense of how poorly I can manage these slides. No, provide you with a sense of, um, from a 30,000-foot level, what uh, EPA has done with its authority under the Clean Air Act to put together a a CO2 proposal for the electric power sector and uh, give you also a sense of how renewable energy can play a part in that, um, in that undertaking. So, so very briefly, I want to talk about 111D, which is the relevant sec uh, section of the Clean Air Act, um, and then EPA's Clean Power Plan and the role of what it calls building blocks. It's kind of the first part of this. The second part, of course, is the development of, of state plans. And um, that's kind of the first half of my comments here. The second part will be looking at um, observations about renewable energy and uh, how, how you folks as um, proponents of uh, the use of renewables have opportunities here, some very interesting opportunities in my view, and um, a look at some of the things you may, may do. Um, okay, so let's just start very broadly with, with the big picture here. Uh, the idea is to get after existing fossil, uh, fossil fuel plants with this program that EPA is putting together. It's already put out a proposal for new plants uh, under 111B uh, of the Clean Air Act. 111D directs EPA to um, to, to follow up once the proposal for um, uh, new resources um, has been put into place. And what they plan is a 30% reduction below 2005, nationwide 2005 levels uh, by 2030. Um, significant reductions are starting in uh, 2020. And as I mentioned, um, this proposal follows the structure set out under 111D of the Clean Air Act. And I think it's really important um, for folks to understand this point, there, this is a two-part, um, a two-part structure. So when you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, um, you can back away and at least ask yourself, okay, is this the EPA part of it, or is this the state part of it? Because 111D sets out requirements for EPA to develop standards, and that's what this proposal is. 
and then for states to produce plans uh, to meet those standards. The language of 111D says to EPA, um, we want you to set a guideline, which I, I just use the word standards, I think that's clear. A guideline sounds voluntary and it's really not. They're setting a standard. Um, but to set a standard based on what EPA considers the best system of emissions reduction. Uh, that's statutory language. It's uh, a quite open and flexible to interpretation. But the statute tells EPA, um, it, it gives EPA a fair bit of leeway uh, in setting the standard. Consider costs, the size of reductions needed, uh, available technology, the feasibility of bringing on that technology. And as, you, uh, as I noted, you know, with, a, with a, uh, the first compliance, um, the interim compliance date of 2020, this is, this is not a sprint, this is a, a marathon. This is a long-term a long proposal. Um, you all certainly have heard the administration talking about its plans here. This is something, uh, this is a proposal that seeks to build on what, uh, what states have been doing and what regions have been doing. This isn't Washington attempting to make the lift all by itself, but it's identifying what's out there, what's happening, what's likely to continue happening um, with respect to the power sector. Um, I think of this as a roadmap for the next several decades. And um, in establishing what EPA has determined to be the best systems of emissions reduction, it's developed something it calls building blocks. Now, um, there are four of these building blocks. And um, I think the best way to understand the building blocks is that um, is that EPA has looked across the electric sector and asked itself where across this entire sector are opportunities for um, uh, avoiding emissions, reducing emissions, becoming cleaner, et cetera, using um, less in the way of fuel to avoid emissions, that kind of thing. And um, so its four building blocks are kind of, uh, the, you can think of the system sort of broken out into pieces. And the first is more a traditional approach where you're optimizing operations of uh, power plants themselves. EPA has looked around the country and it's reached the conclusion that um, there are a number of things that can be done at plants that would result in something like 6% improvement um, in um, carbon intensity associated with power production. It's taking comments as to whether or not that number could go as high as 10%. So there's the traditional, let's look at the plant and see what sort of things we can do. The second building block um, focuses on uh, increasing the use of lower emitting sources. The shorthand here that folks toss around uh, is changing dispatch. In other words, running the dirty guys a little less, running the clean resources a little bit more. The third building block, and this implicates uh, renewables, um, focuses on uh, renewables and on uh, nuclear power. And uh, basically, EPA, uh, EPA's methodology here has um, looked at those sort of three um, opportunities. And um, what EPA has done is broken down the country regionally. For example, in the Northeast, it's looked at New England states. And it said, OK, um, we think that the, there is potential here for renewables production to, uh, um, in, in the Northeast to meet basically what's happening um, generally across that region. So if there are some states in the Northeast that don't have renewables portfolio standards, they can, it is assumed in this proposal, um, do as well as their neighboring states. Uh, what you don't have is uh, a situation where Arizona is compared to Oregon or Mississippi is compared to um, Maryland, let's say. So it's, it's broken out regionally. It looks at best practices, and it assumes that renewables can be deployed at least as well um, as neighboring states are deploying them. Um, I won't go into the, uh, the, the, the nuclear aspects of this third building block. Uh, the final building block is end-use energy efficiency. And um, 
the assumption here is that there can be there's a there's a significant amount of potential for avoiding emissions, just outright avoiding emissions by being more efficient with end use uh, power use. So that's basically the first part of this, this two-part structure that I've described. EPA's come up with assumptions about 48 states. It's developed a rate, an emissions rate, that is pounds per megawatt hour assumptions given uh, the potential here as characterized in these building blocks. Uh, for each of each of these states to make um, certain reductions, interim reductions 2020, final reductions by 2030. Let's shift gears here and move to the states. So EPA has proposed this, um, uh, uh, has proposed these guidelines for states. Um, I believe it was June 2016 that the uh, f the publication came out in the Federal Register, which sets the clock uh, for comments. EPA is providing 120 days for comments, so by October 16, industry, states, other interested parties can provide comments to EPA about this proposal. Um, plans, um, uh, I'm sorry, a final, at least uh, as of today, the f the due the due date for the final. Uh, rule is June 2015, and um, for plans to come in one year later, June 2016. The exception for that plan uh, date of June 2016 is the um, uh, the case where states request uh, an extension of time due to their engagement in um, regional efforts. So if states are banding together and trying to come up with a regional compliance approach here, they, I believe, can have as much uh, time as two extra years, so June 2018 for a plan to come in. Let's talk about state plans a little bit. Um, <clears throat> those of you who are familiar with the Clean Air Act have, have heard the acronym SIP, State Implementation Plan. Section 111D, the, uh, the relevant section of the statute here, refers to state implementation plans uh, as set out in one 10, Section 110 of the Clean Air Act. It's my understanding that EPA is using this as a model, and I really want to emphasize that um, they're talking about uh, state plans as to be based on this state implementation plan model that's set out under, under 110. Um, so I'm not saying that they will work exactly like 110 SIPs, but there's there, at least it's out there as a guidance. And there are a couple, a couple basic things to remember about state implementation plans is set out under 110. They have to contain enforceable emissions limitations. Enforceable. They have to be enforceable on the one hand. So very strict, clear direction there. On the other hand, plans, um, the, the statute provides for a huge amount of flexibility. In other words, as the language, uh, highlighted language here says, you can use control measures, other control measures, means or techniques. Um, and, and obviously go fairly broad. This is the authority under which you know um, you, you see uh, um, uh, the use of economic incentives or marketable permits, you know, marketable sort of approaches. So on the one hand, it has to be enforceable. On the other hand, um, there's a great deal of, of flexibility in um, EPA's uh, proposal here. Now, I've given you a few bullets here to say what a state plan should include. It's, this is not intended to be exhaustive, OK? Um, but um, they encourage, the plan encourages states to look across their entire sector. Now notice, they don't say you have to use our building blocks, but they encourage states to think about using the elements of those building blocks. They're very clear about saying you can use them, you can use other things. You don't have to use them in the same proportions that we're suggesting. Uh, so EPA is being very flexible about what a plan might include. Um, obviously, the emphasis is to tie in what states and regions are doing already with respect to clean energy, bringing in renewables uh, and efficiency, for example, um, and, and other approaches. Uh, I, I put in here um, that it makes, uh, it, and, and they have noted actually that connecting things to all, um, existing state 
energy and environmental planning efforts already is really important. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. States to varying degrees around the country are, uh, are, engaged, in, um, are engaged in planning efforts that uh, help the states understand what their choices are, what their least cost choices are, um, and if you're doing integrated resource planning, which is the uh, sort of the, the full bore, full tilt um, energy planning that takes place before utility commissions, you're looking at numerous uh, scenarios for the future and planning all sorts of alternatives. Um, I would emphasize here that the point um, is, is integrated, not that you take, if you don't have an IRP, you can't do anything. The point is to be integrated here. And of course, CPA is, is pointing out to states you can do what you need to do within the state, uh, within your borders, in your state plan, or you can think about going more broadly. I think it's very important to understand that if you were at EPA and you had to look at 48 different proposals, that uh, proposed plans that come in in a year's time, in two years' time, um, that would be a, a daunting challenge. And if, if states got together and uh, half the number of proposals came in because states are teaming up and trying to work through things, uh, administratively that's certainly much more attractive to EPA. So very basically what, I, what I've just tried to set out here is some of the considerations that go into EPA putting together its, uh, its proposed um, guideline. Uh, for emissions and, and how it's developed rates for different states. Uh, rates for states, that sounds like a bumper sticker. Number one. Number two, uh, some of the elements that go into what states need to do uh, as far as planning. Now what I'd like to do is just take the next few minutes to just make some observations and drill down just a little bit uh, more uh, uh, with respect to uh, proponents of uh, renewables and renewables development. First, um, actually, I have a, a graduate degree in rhetoric. I love rhetoric, but sometimes you just got to get past the rhetoric, and I think it's a really good thing to do. It's it's sort of ironic that I'm talking to renewables proponents and saying, you know, renewables are very attractive, but of course they are, especially as part of a state plan here. They can, um, uh, they. So it's very important to recognize that you are bringing something to states that they can use for compliance and. Um, um, that, that will help them meet the requirements that they are facing. Um, it's very important, and this organization does a great job at getting information to regulators um, and providing them with advice. And I, I've got to say here, when I'm talking about regulators, I'm talking about public utility commissions, but also other regulatory bodies and other participants in, in regulatory uh, efforts. So we're talking about air regulators, obviously. We're talking about state energy offices. Consumer advocates are very important to this process. Um, so bringing that information to all of them, I think, is uh, going to be uh, the task of, uh, that you folks should, should take on as you go forward. Um, in this, in this context. One thing that I think would be really helpful and to the degree that it, um, uh, these have already been done in regions that, that concern you, um, great. Uh, if not, I think uh, doing uh, potential studies for states and regions so folks have a sense of what out there is available in the way of renewables, what can be done, what it might cost, I think that would be very valuable um, as, as states are going to be scrambling for good information. Um, on uh, what sort of a uh, renewable potential is out there. Um, this is, uh, uh, I, I've got to say, this is sort of a shameless plug. Um, CRS and RAP are, are about to come out with a paper. I think it's available on the on the website now. That looks at the um, it, it looks that looks at tracking systems and um, how, how they are used and the protocols that tracking systems use to ensure the, uh, the, the robust nature of the renewables market and the trading of renewable energy certificates. Um, I think that's going to be a, a just one a fundamental piece here um, to make sure that um, the, the resources that you folks are out trying to develop get uh, valued properly, are traded properly, and of course get the, the emissions 
reductions that um, um, that are so important and underlying this this program. Um, so uh, this paper really is not intended to educate you all. You all know about tracking systems and tracking protocols. It's a paper that's intended to uh, be shared with um, utility regulators and air regulators to help them understand how um, if EPA's program allows for um, the trading of RECs and uh, the development of incremental renewables as part of, um, as part of its final uh, proposal here. And, and if states are to use these resources, it just emphasizes how, um, how this should be done uh, properly. I mentioned planning earlier on, and I just want to come back to this a little bit. Um, as, as you work with states, some states are going to have integrated resource planning statutes, and it will be very helpful to get information about renewables before decision makers and advocate groups um, so you understand the value, the relative value in comparison to other resources. But it doesn't have to be uh, IRP itself. Like I said, it can be IRP-like. For instance, in Colorado in 20. 11, there's something, uh, they, uh, that state passed the Clean Air, Clean Jobs Act that um, directed legislatively, directed a couple of companies, Excel was the largest, um, to uh, look at its system, remove some of its dirty plants and replace it with cleaner resources and look at all the alternatives and uh, explore the, the least cost approaches. And that's something that Colorado did. It's a, uh, it's a very interesting example. It didn't proceed under the IRP statute, but it was an integrated analysis. Renewables has a great place and, and a great story to tell within these analyses, and it's, um, I think it's uh, an interesting example to look at. Um, Sierra Club in uh, the state of Oklahoma and I think several other states has advocated for something it calls integrated environmental compliance planning, which is essentially the sort of process that happened in Colorado. The emphasis is being integrated and uh, when you look at, when you put together a portfolio of resources, renewables uh, can play a big part there. At the very least, um, when, when you are participating in discussions before air agencies or before the utility commission in a more formal sense, it's really important to understand the risk, the relative risk of all the resources that are being proposed. So to the degree dirtier resources are being proposed, understanding the risk and then making comparison to cleaner resources um, is something that needs to, um, needs to continue to happen. I mentioned this earlier, but I want to come back and just amplify this for a second. Thinking in terms of states is great, but thinking in terms of regions might be helpful. Um, uh, might be helpful to you. A larger uh, market for renewables, certainly, but also um, so that's uh, 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 good for industry. EPA will have less of an administrative lift, arguably. Uh, looking at larger programs, having to review fewer uh, proposals. Um, and there are benefits also for states with respect to shared development and administrative costs. I'd like to focus here on, um, I, I think it's a, a very interesting point to recognize, and, and some of you may understand this, some may not. Um, as I mentioned, states have to develop plans. It's going to be the state environmental regulator, the state air office more precisely, that's going to develop a plan. Now, they have authority to adopt emissions reduction requirements, right? Um, but they don't really understand least cost environment, uh, environmental compliance solutions. They don't understand cost recovery like state energy regulators do. So um, as, as you move forward and participate in these uh, efforts, I think it's really important to recognize uh, the limitations uh, jurisdictional limitations of some of these players um, with whom you'll be dealing. So it's, it's an opportunity, quite simply, it's, it's an opportunity for, uh, for you to sit down with state environmental regulators and help them understand least cost approaches, to help them understand how the cost of compliance approaches that they may support will be recovered 
before the utility commissions. Likewise, when you work with state energy regulators, PUCs, uh, and uh, consumer advocates especially, getting consumer advocates on your side is going to be a big part of this, I would think. Um, getting them to understand the emissions uh, benefits of renewable energy is something that's going to be a challenge. These folks understand least cost, they understand cost recovery, but the environmental benefits is something that they're going to um, going to need uh, your help with. And so you're sort of reaching across the aisle and stepping across uh, between two disciplines and, and helping folks understand. Um, and I, I just want to emphasize this finally uh, more broadly. So you're working with environmental and energy regulators. And um, not only that, you're working with state consumer advocates and energy offices. And I would argue even with the EPA regions because they're the ones who are going to be approving these plans. Now they're going to get direction from EPA central to do that, but you have a number of places to visit and uh, a number of folks to educate with respect to this. And um, I don't think that uh, the, the actual process that's going to occur in every state is going to be the same, that it needs to be the same, but I think uh, exactly how that process works the degree to which um, renewable advocates like yourselves will be able to engage at the state level I think is really important and that's not yet written in stone. So that's something to think about and um, identifying potential allies is something that you want to uh, work through and as I say you've got a, um, a several doors to knock on here to understand, to help folks understand just how this process can work. Um, to work best for you. So I guess with, with those observations, I will, um, I'll stop talking and, uh, and hand it off to uh, Chris and Matt. Hey, thanks very much, Dave. That was a really useful um, overview of what's going on with the um, EPA rule and how it relates to renewables. We're now going to have Matt Klaus and Chris Sherry are going to uh, respond to some of Dave's comments and fill in around the edges, but let me tell you a little bit more about them. As I mentioned before, Ms. Matt Klaus is Director of Renewable Energy Policy and Programs in the Climate Protection Partnerships Division in the Office of Air and Radiation at EPA, and he's been at EPA since 2000. Um, he joined the agency in order to design and launch the Green Power Partnership which is a non-regulatory program that works with organizations to build demand for renewable electricity. And he also plays a leading role in the Climate Leadership Awards that EPA manages in partnership with three nonprofits. His colleague Chris Sherry is a policy and analyst in the Climate Change Division in the Office of Air Radi and Radiation at EPA. He's been at EPA for three years Prior to that, he worked for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and was the staff lead there on the development and implementation of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So let me turn it over to Matt and Chris for you folks to add a little bit in before we turn it over to questions. Great. Thanks, Warren, and, and uh, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, we, we both, Chris and I, uh, this is Matt, both of us listened uh, to David's presentation and, and thought substantially there were no uh, issues really worth uh, correcting or, uh, so perhaps it's useful for us to provide a few kind of uh, public uh, you know, statements that are helpful for folks to remind them of some key dates and then and then talk a little bit more, add a little bit into what David presented. So, um, so one of the things that uh, it's a public service announcement for you all is, you know, we proposed the Clean Power Plan on June second, and um, and on that date we made a number of the documents available, uh, covering the preamble and regulatory impact assessment, and a number of technical support documents. Uh, if you looked at the bottom of each of those pages carefully, you will have seen that uh, that was not the final, final version of those documents. Uh, with the publishing of the plan in the Federal Register on the 18th, uh, so last week on Wednesday, uh, 
we posted all of the final documents um, on uh, regulations.gov. So if, if you need any help finding that, you can go to the EPA uh, uh, carbon pollution webpage to find a link to that in those documents. Uh, you'll want to look at those. There shouldn't be any significant changes between what was put on the website in June 2nd, but it's always worth using the, the official version uh, when, when trying to understand all of the elements and also provide comments. With that, I would say um, there are a lot of questions coming into EPA from various groups, uh, clarifying questions that we're trying to address. Um, and it's generally helpful to um, understand that a lot of answers to those questions are in the materials. We understand you know, it's important for us to answer questions that not everybody has the time to go through in depth, but there is a lot of material in those and uh, word searches are very helpful to find uh, the renewable sections. Um, and, and for instance, as Dave mentioned, RECs, you can search for renewable energy certificates and find that where that's discussed, um, et cetera. So um, I think Dave did a great job of talking about the basic background uh, and, and, and the development of the goals. Um, perhaps we can add a little bit to that. And then the flexibility that states have in, uh, in, in meeting the uh, carbon intensity targets that they've been given in those goals. Um, uh, I think as far as factoring renewable energy into the state goals, an important announcement or public service announcement there is that uh, we encourage you to look at both of the proposed methods uh, used in building block three for renewable energy. So to be clear, there are two proposed methods. Um, each uh, was based in part on renewable potential, and, and so therefore each state's goal is based in part on renewable potential. The first method, what we call the proposed renewable energy method, uses regionally averaged RPS targets um, to derive or to create a metric for growing each state's generation from 2012 levels. 2012 is the year with most current uh, historical generation data. Uh, the alternate uh, renewable method uses technical potential to determine benchmark renewable energy capture rates. And so the leading states' uh, renewable energy capture rates for renewable technologies are then applied to other states, at, but they're somewhat constrained by economic potential criteria. So um, we've gotten some questions that say, oh, should we consider these methods equally? Or is one more important than the other? We would encourage you to look at both of those methods and consider how um, uh, they impact states' targets and the stringency of those targets. Uh, certainly, we would want feedback on uh, whether there's a more reasonable basis uh, for changing uh, the elements of those methodologies uh, that could have an impact on what the state targets are. Uh, do you have anything, Chris, to add on that? Sure. Yeah, I guess I, I uh, build off Dave's presentation a little bit in terms of fleshing out um, just some of the flexibility that, that states have that I think you all should, should be aware of. Um, Let me, I can sure. give a quick high, high point in that and then we can talk more about compliance. Sure. So as far as just using renewable energy to meet state goals, um, it's really important to make clear this basic point that, that states have the option to include renewable measures and requirements in their state plans. Um, in the first week or so after the proposal came out, one of the key questions was, do states have to use the building blocks that EPA used in, in setting the state targets? And the answer is no. Thank you, Dave, for making that clear, too. But no, you don't, you're not limited to the elements that EPA used to set the state targets. You could use, uh, states could use uh, those components in uh, developing their compliance plan, but they're not limited to that, and there are other things they could use. Um, so as for if a state were to include renewable measures in their state plan, 
Uh, we in the we talk about in both the preamble and the technical support documents uh, uh, that's called state plan considerations. We talk about the need for those measures to be quantifiable, non-duplicative, permanent, verifiable, and enforceable. Um, and with that, a, another common question we get is about the role that existing renewable generation could play in state plans. I think the most succinct way we found is to, to talk about that is that future renewable generation from existing renewable capacity may be credible if it's in compliance with renewable measures that are specified in state plans. Um, and then the last thing um, is clearly, and Dave touched upon this as well, states have the option to uh, work together uh, and develop uh, a multi-state approach uh, that could involve interstate trading of renewables. Uh, those are kind of the high-level points there. Um, you know, I guess the other high, other just general public service information is, uh, you know, we're going to have four public hearings uh, the week of July 28th in Denver, Atlanta, Pittsburgh, and here in Washington, D.C. So we encourage you to take advantage of those public events. Um, and uh, also encourage you to reach out to EPA from your organization if there are clarifying questions uh, that you would like to, to be um, you know, clarified directly. We, when we do meet with uh, um, organizations, we uh, docket those meetings for, um, for the, in other words, we capture the highlights of those meetings for public documents. Um, I think that, that's it. Sure. Um, I guess I'll, I'll step back a little bit and highlight a couple of things that I think would be helpful for, for this group. Um, you know, Dave mentioned and, and Matt mentioned that we're providing a lot of flexibility to states in terms of the specific emission reduction measures that they include in their plans. Um, but folks should also be aware of the fact that we're providing a lot of flexibility as well in terms of the overall sort of structure of those plans or as I, I tend to refer to as the different types of state plan pathways that, that states might might choose. So first of all, there's flexibility in terms of the form of the goal. So we're proposing a rate-based emission performance goal for the affected power plants uh, for each state. So that's pounds of CO2 per, per megawatt hour of energy output. But states also have the flexibility through a projection exercise to translate that rate-based goal into a mass-based goal. So they can, they can either select, uh, you know, meeting an uh, average rate-based performance level or translating that into tons and, and meeting a tonnage uh, performance level in their plan. So I think that's something to keep in mind because it, it has some, some implications for, for how renewables could potentially be treated in the context of those, of those plans. Um, there's also sort of four different pathways, if you will, that are available. Um, and this can be break, broken down into two basic categories. One is emission limits that apply directly to EGUs and then the other is what we're referring to as a portfolio approach. So under an emission limit approach, there'd be an enforceable limitation that applies to the power plants, and that limitation on its own would ensure that the states achieve their performance goals for the, the affected power plants. Um, under a rate-based approach, that could include crediting or administrative adjustment by the state for the effects of things like renewable energy and end-use energy efficiency did avoid emissions from those power plants. Um, so potentially that could involve um, crediting um, in a com from a compliance standpoint by the, those, those EGUs where they're using efficiency and renewable credits in some context to meet that rate limit. They'd essentially be able to adjust their rate based on the effects of those measures. And in that context, renewables would be an enforceable measure in the state plan. And I guess I'd underline this, if it's in the approved state plan, those state measures would ultimately be uh, federally enforceable. Um, the other emission limit approach is, is a mass-based limit. Um, so states could apply a mass limit on their power plants. That limit would be sufficient to achieve the mass-based goal that they had, um, that they con they'd converted their rate-based goal to a mass-based goal. Um, that limit would assure achievement of that goal. But under that context, states could also include a number of complementary policies as part of their overall strategy to meet that mass limit. But those things would be outside of the 
the state plan. So you could have things like RPSs and EERSs and things of that nature that are you know, part of, a key part of the state strategy for, for meeting that mass limit, but they would essentially be off the books, if you will, from a state plan perspective. They would not be federally enforceable in that context. They would not be things that we're reviewing and approving as part of that state plan, but they could be part of the overall strategy. Um, the third basic approach would be what we're referring to as a portfolio approach. So there's emission limits on the EGUs, either a rate limit or a mass limit, but those limits on their own are not sufficient to achieve the state goal for the affected power plant. Chris, excuse me, if I could interrupt, if you could finish up in a minute or so so we have time for questions, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, so in that context, they need to be supplemented by enforceable measures, things like RPSs and, and other types of measures that, that reduce or avoid emissions from those EGUs to achieve the goal. And in that context, they would also be federally enforceable elements of the state plan. And an example here would be an IRP-like process that, that Dave highlighted uh, in his, his presentation. So that's another available pathway. So I just wanted to sort of lay those sort of different types of structures that states might be thinking about when they're developing their plans to give you a sense of how renewables might be incorporated into a plan. There's a lot of sort of permutations of how that might uh, ultimately be implemented by states. And in some contexts, it would be an enforceable element. In others, it would be complementary at, at the discretion of the state. So I just wanted to highlight that, that basic sort of structural issue for everybody. Hey, great. Thank you very much. Um, I think your additional information added a lot to what Dave started with, but we now have some questions. And a couple of them I'm going to present at once, which have to do with tracking of renewables and renewable credits, because we have a lot of folks on the call who are RPS administrators who are intimately involved in the issue of tracking renewables. And one issue, and maybe this is for um, Dave, if you could respond first, and I'm going to do the two questions, and then maybe um, Chris and Matt could respond second. The first one is, how does this new um, EPA rule potentially um, complicate the tracking of renewable energy certificates and potentially make things more um, complicated for folks who are administering RPS programs. And here's a specific question that came in along these lines from someone else. If a state is home to a wind generator and claims that generation is part of its plan, what happens when that wind energy is sold to another state? Suppose the purchasing state wants to claim the in wind energy. How would these double claims be avoided? Great questions. I think those are, um, th that's really, uh, you know, the, it's sort of a garden variety uh, first step in understanding how um, these tracking systems would work. I, I think it's important, uh, just to, so just allow me to talk about tracking systems and, and then we'll talk about the EPA policy because the EPA policy is just a proposal and uh, I, I can't tell you what EPA is going to decide ultimately. But um, when we just talk about tracking systems, you've just described a scenario that, um, that involves, uh, you know, production of energy, assuming that the generator in state A has put the, uh, you know, has, has put together the megawatt hours in its account and that that generator um, uh, could take credit for it if the generator were uh, uh, an integrated utility or if somebody in that state, uh, if a load serving entity in that state wanted to get credit for it because the generator has the RECs in its generator account uh, and because they haven't been traded, you can verify that according to protocols that have been around since the mid 90s okay when you sell those uh, when you sell those recs it's it's very interesting I think of this as a it's, it's basic like a, it's like a checking account when I when I when I write Warren a ten dollar check and he takes it uh, I can't claim that I have that ten dollars in my account and in fact when the machinations of the uh, the tracking system or the checking account at the bank work, uh, $10 is taken, debited from my account, and credited to his. 
And it's a, it's a perfectly simple example that given the way the tracking systems work, that example um, would, uh, um, re one would reach a conclusion with that example that the receiving state, if it gets the wreck and if it retires it appropriately, that the ownership of that wreck and the proper retirement would allow the receiving state to credit, uh, to, to take credit under a policy like an RPS or like EPA's 111D program. And that the sending state, once that transfer is made, would not be able to make that claim. Chris or Matt, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, I guess I, I will just quickly um, just outline what we proposed in terms of the, the treatment for interstate emission effects. Um, for renewable energy, we proposed that if a state measure, so an enforceable measure in a plan is resulting in renewable generation and that generation happens to occur in another state, that, that that specific state with the policy could essentially claim the the emission effects of that generation under their plan. Um, and we're also taking on taking comment on how we could implement that approach on an individual state plan basis without it leading to, to double counting of emission effects. We're also proposing that this could be addressed in a couple ways in the context of a multi-state plan. Uh, so one would be essentially a cooperative accounting approach uh, in terms of emissions performance similar to sort of the checking account example that Dave provided where there's crediting and debiting, if you will, in terms of these emission effects based on, on renewable generation that, that happens out of state. And then the other option in a multi-state basis is that the states jointly are demonstrating performance for all of the affected power plants in their multi-state region. And if that's in, in the context of an interconnected grid region and contiguous, then um, this interstate attribution wouldn't, ne wouldn't be necessary, um, depending on the type of, of plan. So just a little snapshot in terms of what we propose and what we're seeking comment on with regard to this issue. OK, good. Here's another question for um, Matt and Chris. Can you please explain how hydropower is treated in the proposed rule? For example, existing hydro is excluded in determining the BSER in the low zero carbon generation building block. Why? How does existing hydro and future new hydro capacity figure into the overarching program and the development of the state target? Uh, OK. I'll, I'll, there's more information that's explicit about the role of hydro. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, quick stab at that. So um, under the proposed method uh, where we look at um, you know, the, the state RPS targets, the existing hydro is largely not included in those targets, so it's largely not captured there. However, there is uh, potential for incremental hydro and, and other forms of hydro, um, like Road of the River, to be used for compliance in those state targets. So there is some capture of, of hydropower and some existing uh, hydropower in uh, the proposed method. The, um, the uh, alternate method um, did uh, look at uh, a number of technologies and primarily um, uh, looked at uh, other technologies and did not um, as I recall, look at large hydro and expanding that. But there's certainly the potential for that, and it certainly could be utilized uh, in compliance with state plans. OK. And this is to go back to this issue of um, the policies in one state affecting the renewables in another state. And I've got a bunch of. Um, questions about that. And clearly for our audience here, uh, which is primarily or heavily individuals who work on state renewable energy programs and RPSs, that's a big issue. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the questions, but folks at EPA should know that I'm sure there's going to be lots of comments on that. But one I wanted to say raises that EPA determines state emission rate goals based upon the amount of renewable generation inside the state, even if some or all of that renewable generation is currently being 
used to meet out-of-state RPS policies and voluntary goals. The question is, why was that approach taken, and will that create any problems for um, creating fair state targets going forward? Well, I think the alternate uh, um, method uh, is a way for us to, you know, get a better picture of in-state potential, and so uh, that's a large reason why it was utilized. Um, uh, so I think that's um, that's the easiest answer to that question. Yeah, and I guess I just sort of follow up on that. I mean. It, the, the framework in Clean Air Act 111D is really on a, on a state focus in terms of setting standards of performance for states for the power plants in their in their state. So that's that's sort of the starting point, at least from a statutory standpoint, in, in deriving the goals. On the state plan side, I mean, we're but we're we are acknowledging in in the proposal that we've approved that we've we've uh, we've uh, proposed is is that there are you know. State policies in terms of RPS in many cases are interstate in nature, um, and there is interstate trading, and, and states are really sort of sharing in the benefits and costs of, of renewables development in their in their grid regions. Uh, so we've we've uh, given a nod to that existing infrastructure, if you will, from a policy standpoint in terms of our proposed approach. That said, we're seeking comment on on all of these issues, um, and we want to get people's feedback um, in terms of you know what some of the you know on the ground implications of, of the approach might be um, given the policies in individual states. Uh, we're also encouraging states to, to band together to, to address some of these issues jointly in a similar manner to, to how they're sharing the benefits and costs of, of just managing the, the, the current grid going forward. Um, so that's, that's just another aside. But you know, we really do want this type of feedback in terms of are there on the ground implications that people think might be problematic based on the, the, the proposed approach or the alternative approach and are, are there ways to to improve the improve the rule on final based on that feedback. Yeah, I guess I'd also ask uh, for additional information too on the uh, what what is historically been happening in terms of compliance uh, with state RPSs using out of state resources. Um, and our search for information on that, there's not a lot of information. Uh, absent reviewing um, each state compliance plan, and we did not have the luxury of uh, being able to do that. Um, so I'm aware that uh, the latest LDNL NREL report did look through state compliance plans and provided a little bit of information on some states on where their recs are coming for state compliance, but uh, more information on that would be of interest. Uh, we have, I'm aware of some expert opinion out there, but uh, I'm more interested in seeing uh, historical data. That's a, that's a very good um, point, and that does seem a topic very worth worthy of additional research. Um, I had a question come in that talks about the EIA data that was used, and this is, and then I'd like Dave to respond about whether this, there's an opportunity here or not that the EIA data of renewable energy levels may underestimate um, the amount of renewables that are um, currently online in the form of distributed solar generation. Yeah. Um, if that is underreported, is that first a problem with the data that was used. And the second thing, is there a real opportunity here for distributed solar generation as being one of the solutions um, for states to meet their targets? I mean, I'll start with the, the second question first, Warren. I mean, it's clear, in our mind, clearly, we think there's an opportunity for distributed renewable generation, solar or other types. Um, and, and so as to your first question, the historic data from 2012, you know, EIA is, uh, data is a go-to source for us uh, in terms of its transparency and, um, and, uh, and use to everyone. Um, so to the extent that, that it's under-reporting uh, distributed renewables, particularly solar, um, 
it, it, I believe that's probably likely, and uh, you know, it, I'm not sure that it creates problems uh, for us. Uh, and if you look at the proposed method, um, many state RPS targets do specifically acknowledge distributed generation, um, and uh, I believe that the alternate RE approach um, does also look at uh, technology, uh, technical potential capture of, of solar, particularly distributed solar too. So I would. I would hope that our methods are um, trying to capture that, but I, do I suspect that you know more information there would be useful? Yes, I think so. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. I'm going to give Dave the last word in a minute, but before I do that, I want to um, tell folks on the line, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. Um, you know, I'd encourage you to write to any of the speakers. The other thing is, through the RPS Collaborative, we will be doing other follow-up uh, webinars, writing papers, and other things related to the um, EPA rule. And if you have suggestions of webinars or topics you want us to cover, you know, please write, and uh, we'll try to accommodate you. Um, but Dave. Anything you want to sum up and say in conclusion? Well, thank you, Warren. I, I, I appreciate this opportunity. First, I'd like to commend EPA. I think they've done they've done such a such a, a terrific job here, and I and I want to emphasize that um, as as they have pointed out, this is a proposal. It's like it's a rulemaking. So this is a legislative sort of model where lots of input is necessary on the DG point. There, there have been similar comments made about the value of energy efficiency. Um, and so EPA has been very open to getting as much information as possible. And I, I think I have no reason to believe that that wouldn't continue. So I think it's uh, that's something that states ought to emphasize um, and 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 folks should take advantage of. I, I finally would just point out that as far as um, <clears throat> I think it's really important to distinguish between the capacity of tracking systems and what policies states or the federal government might adopt. Tracking systems are perfectly capable of keeping track of every last bit of energy developed, every last nickel, so to speak, and um, using developing policies in a way that um, uh, don't result in, in double counting but take advantage of um, the potential here for greater renewable development and um, greater clean energy investment I think is is the key here and uh, I look forward to seeing this go forward. Good and to reiterate um, you mentioned a report that RAP and the Center for resource solutions coming out about which is a introductory primer to tracking systems. Um, people, if they're interested in that, will be able to find that on the website either of the Re Regulatory Assistance Pro Project or the Center for Resource Solutions in a few short days. Um, you'll be able to find this webinar Muted. on the site of Unmuted. States Alliance. And I really want to thank Matt and Chris and Dave for sharing a lot of very good information with us today. And um, we'll be coming back to this topic again and again because it's very important and also exciting. So thanks, everybody.